The University of Iowa is located on the homelands of the Ojibwe and Anishinaabe, Bahoji, Iowa, Kickapoo, Kickapoo, Omatmanewak, Menominee, Miamika, Miami, Natuchi, Missouri, Omaha, Omaha, Wazaji, Osage, Jawer, Oto, Odawa, Ottawa, Ponca, Ponca, Potawatomi, Nishnabe, Potawatomi, Nishquaki, Nemahaki, Sakawaki, Dakota, Lakota, Nakota, Sanish, Nubaka, Nueta, and the Ho Chunk Nations. The following tribal nations, the Omaha tribe of Nebraska and Iowa, Ponca tribe of Nebraska, Sac and Fox Nation of the Mississippi and Iowa, and Winnebago tribe of Nebraska continue to thrive in the state of Iowa, and we continue to acknowledge them. As an academic institution, it is our responsibility to acknowledge the sovereignty and the traditional territories of these tribal nations and the treaties that were used to remove these tribal nations and the histories of dispossession that have allowed for the growth of this institution since 1847. Consistent with the university's commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Understanding the historical and current experiences of Native peoples will help inform the work we do collectively as a university to engage in building relationships through academic scholarship, collaborative partnerships, community service, enrollment and retention efforts, acknowledging our past, our present, and future Native nations. Welcome to the Stanley Museum's Grant Wood Fellow Talk, A Growing Pain, Self Meditations, Chronologies Surrendering, Who Am I Now? with Jonathan Payne. I'm Kimberly Datchett, Curator of Learning and Engagement. Jonathan Payne obtained a BA in art from Rhodes College in 2012 and received his MFA in painting and printmaking from Yale School of Art in 2018. His work has recently been exhibited in the Bridge to Uncertainty at Columbus College of Art and Design's Beeler Gallery project space, Threads at Foxy Productions in New York, and Miss Lily Vladis at Delhi Gallery in Brooklyn. A New American Paintings, MFA, Annual Number 135, and has been published in The New Yorker, The New York Times, Observer, and Vice. Jonathan was a Spring 2020 Artist in Residence at Crosstown Arts in Memphis, Tennessee, and is currently the Grant Wood Fellow in Painting and Drawing. He was the inaugural recipient of the Amina Residency in Summer 2021. Welcome, Jonathan, and thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you, Kimberly, and um, thank you for having me, everyone, at the Stanley Museum of Art. Um, it's uh, an honor to be sharing my work with you all. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and um, share my screen. So when I brainstormed this talk, I I thought that. Um, I thought that sort of engaging it from a different vantage point of the, uh, from the standpoint of being the artist and also like sort of taking into consideration, um, yeah, just like sort of how uh, navigating an artist's life during the pandemic um, has impacted me and has impacted my perceptions on, um, on my own perception of, of, of what I'm doing and, um, and sort of the demands of maintaining a specific type of trajectory or career as an artist. Um, so uh, there are some things that, uh, like basically there, I, I just like to show you all what I have been doing over the last sort of year, um, the, yeah, almost nearly year and a half. Um, and some of this will overlap with my previous talk um, just because, um, <laughs> a year is not a whole lot of time, um, but uh, yeah. So I wanted to revisit an exhibition that I was in in New York City beginning of 2021 called Threads as noted in um, Kimberly's introduction. And this exhibition was um, really an, an awesome opportunity 
um, for me to sort of have my work contextualized alongside other um, queer artists working within an expanded tradition or and or context of um, fibers and um, fiber based art practices. And so um, in the foreground, uh, Steve Frankie's um, needle um, point embroideries are installed and then um, three of my gridded paintings and then a print by um, Ulrich um, Weller. And these images, I, I presented these images in my last talk. Uh, however, I, uh, I have some detail shots that I'm going to share of each painting in, in this presentation. And something that's beautiful about detail shots in general, <laughs> but in, in specifically in relationship to my work is that you can really see the, um, the texturality and the materiality of the surface of the paintings. And so these are constructed out of shredded paper and units. Um, and then those units are then adhered and then um, embroidered together. Um, and then primed and painted over. So like I said, the texturality of the surface, the, the way that um, paint is, is, is mixing on the surface and overlapping on the surface that is really accentuated through the detail shots. And then um, sometimes just given the nature of this work, I, I may need to mend areas that get torn or ripped by accident. And so you can see in this image on the left, there are these two um, sort of rectangular, um, three actually sort of shaped, um, pieces of paper that have been added on top of the, the, the line. Um, and then there are these um, sort of almost like a mended sort of stitch element that you can see where I've, I've um, those areas um, were torn, that it had, the work had caught a nail while I was installing it and ripped through three, um, yeah, three, three lines a part of the work. And so, um, yeah, the mending process is, a, is an element in these as well. And then also the thread becomes this additional line um, variety and weight and directionality that engages with the structure of the gridded geometry. Um, so <clears throat> at the end of last academic school year going into the summer, I um, left, Iowa City to go to Columbus, Ohio, where I was the inaugural recipient of the Amina Residency. And the Amina Residency um, is uh, a new residency that is created um, by the Columbus Museum of Art, as well as the Greater Columbus Arts Council. And together, these two arts organizations in Columbus, Ohio, are continuing the legacy of um, the late Amina Brenda Lynn Robinson, a Columbus-based visual artist, um, Black American woman, born and raised in Columbus, who um, was a 2004 MacArthur Genius Grant recipient, who um, made a lot of work about, across varying media, about her lived experience growing up in a predominantly Black neighborhood of uh, Columbus, Ohio, and, and also um, more broadly, um, taking into, taking um, um, uh, influence from uh, African American history, um, such as you know the transatlantic slave trade, uh, the election of Barack Obama, um, um, a lot of different topics uh, and interests like went into her work, and so um, uh, her home was the site of both her living space and also her studio space for. Um, most of her adult career. Uh, and so this um, 
house becomes the site of this residency. And so I stayed in Amina's home um, for about three months and had the honor of, um, of, of living and working there. And as you can see inside of the house there, um, there was a studio space addition added to the house. And so that is where the studio is located. But um, historically speaking, Amina worked in every single room of the house. Um, it was a really amazing experience. This is the living room. Uh, every, nearly all the windows are completely filled in with these glass cinder blocks. So there's a lot of great bright indirect light. I had like a wonderful time uh, getting into plants and uh, growing plants in, in this space, but also just having this space to sort of, um, yeah, rest, relax, make work. Um, and learn about this incredible person who contributed so much to, um, to art and art history, but is largely still um, under uh, historicized and, and under acknowledged for her contributions. Um, she was a, a big collector of pop-up books. And so there are some pop-up books um, on the bookshelf on the left in the sunroom pictured here and then also, um, just uh, another element, picture of, um, yeah, one of her sculptures, um, which includes figurines that have heads made out of a material called hogmog, um, just this, you know, clay, mud, um, homemade recipe that her and her father had crafted when, you know, she was um, a child and that she continued to use throughout her adult life as um, a, an art, a material. Uh, and then a wonderful picture of her weaving here and then some images of <laughs> some of the plants I bought. Um, yeah. Dining room. And it, a detail of her tiled kitchen floor. So, um, when I say that she sort of in, in the whole entire house had uh, um, sort of sort of a relics of her artistic making, she painted on the walls, she painted on the cabinets in the kitchen, she mosaic tiled the um, the kitchen floor, and you know with buttons and marbles and um, even her late son's teeth, you know. So she just every the home environment was very much an extension of her um, her canvas, her her substrates, her um, her art. And it was really beautiful that um, in the renovation of the house in preparation for the residency that the Columbus Art Museum and the GCAC um, left these things intact. Um, and so this is a picture of works in progress that I had in Amina's sanctuary also known as her studio and uh, this is uh, maybe a, a cool image to see in comparison to in relationship to uh, the uh, previous images of my work because this shows you sort of where the work is at a very formative stage this is post construction but pre priming and painting and so um, uh, yeah these are these this is all cut paper and then um, the paper has been constructed, collaged together into these um, densely uh, geometric compositions. And then this is just a picture of um, Amina's books and collectibles in the living room of her home and a great portrait of her on the left and a reproduction of one of her prints on the right. So culminating my time in Columbus, Ohio, I uh, mounted a, a solo exhibition of, of mostly recent and past and a new work. Um, three months is, uh, <laughs> three months goes by really fast, especially um, when you are in a new city that has uh, a lot of fun things to do sort of during the first wave of, of uh, of, um, of kind of returning from quarantine. So, at, you know, maybe the precursor to hot vac summer, all of this is ridiculous language, but 
<laughs> uh, all to say, um, I did not make as much work as I thought I would in Columbus. However, it was an incredible opportunity for me to show case the work that I have done and have accomplished there. So, um, so I'm very appreciative of the new audiences that I was able to um, to to meet and and bridge with with this experience. And and to some regards, that also is uh, informing the title of this show, which is called A Bridge to Uncertainty. Um, so here in this show, I presented a, a, some of the paintings that were included in the, two of the three paintings included in the Foxy production show earlier that year, as well as a body of three large scale, um, eight by eight foot um, constructions pieces, comic constructions, which you see on the left. So uh, I'll just show you all some install shots I have. And these three pieces are made out of shredded comics and they are made in, um, in grids of three by three 30 inch panels. So you can see um, more or less where, uh, where those um, units come together. And this was a really beautiful installation because we were able to sort of hang the pieces off um, up off the wall using long pins. So there's a really beautiful shadow relationship happening between the, the pieces. Um, this painting is called Static Shock, also from the Foxy production show. And then this is a painting that I, I finished in Columbus, Ohio, uh, titled Bloodline. And this is a, it up close. I think Bloodline kind of became a really good title for this one just because I was thinking a lot about the, re, my relationship to Amina in so far as I was, you know, the first resident living in her house. And then a lot of her work um, centers around concepts like Sankofa, which uh, um, I don't, exactly know what it means, but there, there is a lot of um, her work contextualizing the uh, Afro-diasporic experience by way of storytelling and by way of calling back to the past and to the experience of um, the ancestors in order to sort of make sense of the present and the future. And so I sort of wanted to honor her um, conceptual and artistic um, legacy by way of the title of this piece. And then this is just an image of the work installed in space. And I think that people, it can be very confusing, I think, when you see documentation of my work because um, it is so flat, but it is in textural. There is, um, there, it, it's, it's more or less a constructed ground. And so, um, so I, I really like this picture because it, it shows, um, it shows that in space. Uh, so I returned here to Iowa City after my time in Columbus, Ohio, to do a second Grant Wood Fellowship year. And I'm uh, very fortunate to have had the opportunity to do that, um, and that that was extended to me by the fellowship and also by the School of Art and Art History. And one of the first things, um, one of the things I, I, that occurred upon returning was um, the mounting of the 2019, the 2021 Grant Wood Fellows exhibition. And this exhibition, um, uh, I guess was a long time coming just because you know every year an exhibition is held, but because of the pandemic that um, the 2019-2020 cohort, their exhibition was put off. And then, um, you know, Elena and myself both being 2020-2021 recipients uh, of the fellowship, um, it just made sense to sort of combine um, combine the cohorts in order to have a, a, a multi-person exhibition. And so that occurred um, in last semester at the Leva Gallery in Art Building West. And I, um, I just have some, a couple of installation shots and then some images of work that I contributed to the show. And so here, uh, my pieces are to the right on the wall and then Elena, 
um, the Printmaking Fellow currently um, has a beautiful sculpture installed here, installation. And here is my um, pieces installed next to a video work by uh, uh, Diana Blue. And yeah, this is uh, one of the paintings I had in the show or the painting I had in the show. And so if you, this painting is actually a, uh, this is the, the, the ground by which I painted static shock on top of. And so if you can kind of see there is um, uh, the pattern, um, the, the geometric pattern that makes up static shock is, is evidenced here. However, it, um, it more or less is a stencil painting uh, resulting from you know, this substrate catching all of the excess material um, painted uh, dripping around the positive of um, that painting. <clears throat> and, you know, it, it can be very, uh, it's very fascinating to me to sort of see this as a, as an archive or a document of that process, just because uh, the final piece, it looks so different, but, um, but there's a lot of actual, like, chromatic color work happening sort of underneath those layers. And then I included this series of 2019, late 2019, um, uh, comic book, uh, like comic frame weavings. And so what I what I mean by that is that these, uh, there are three images, and in, in comic books, there oftentimes is uh, there be sequences that show the transformation of one character from one state to another. And so um, that usually happens over the course of three to five frames. And, um, and the frames are, um, there are, sometimes there are subtle shifts, sometimes there are overt shifts, but ultimately it's meant to sort of show the transformation of somebody from point A to point B. Um, and to, you know, from, from good guy to bad guy, from um, superhero to civilian, et cetera. And so with these weavings, I took those images, I um, expanded them in Photoshop and then printed them as inkjet prints and then deconstructed the images and reconstituted them into these weavings where um, the, sequential, um, the sequential narrative uh, of those pictures and of the text is sort of, um, um, sort of like collapse onto itself. Um, so the first image on the left is you know, image one and two, the second is two and three, the third is one and three. Um, and so they still show that transformation from one state to the next, but it's not as um, clear. And the same is the case with this one. Called into pure energy. And I wanted to include some images from my sketchbook in this lecture. I think sketching for me this past year has been very helpful because um, the nature of my work is, can be very time intensive, can be very repetitive, is very process based. And so um, sometimes it's nice to work on things that are a little bit more quick and immediate and um, that I don't, um, require so so much um, conceptualizing and so um, so these are just some images from my sketchbook a lot of it is um, uh, ink drawings um, India ink drawings and, and um, ink pen ballpoint pen drawings um, of varying degrees of speed and quickness and you know the subject matter is not something that I'm super caught up on or pressed about. I um, Sometimes it's just a matter of moving the material around. Sometimes it's um, just kind of informed by, um, by things I like. Flowers seem to come up a lot <laughs> in these. And then also like these, these sort of um, patterns or, or like drawn tapestries that um, include more sort of um, abstracted but more like overt uh, reference to 
um, things like phalluses or um, or orifices and et cetera, et cetera. Um, things that aren't necessarily things that don't that don't show up in my gridded abstractions, like and things that I don't necessarily um, know if I I want to be read as as anything phallic or whatnot. But um, but the but the sketchbook is a space where where a lot of um, a lot of that play and you know more overt queerness can come out. So um, fast forward to this spring where uh, I've been able to do a couple of really cool projects and this one I'll explain in, um, now. Uh, so I had the, the, the opportunity of going to Esterville um, ELC Middle School in Esterville, Iowa and to work with the um, students in art classes at the middle school. Um, uh, I was invited by the art teacher there named Jerry Wilson, and he uh, has been inviting artists to come work with his students, um, sort of as these like two day uh, workshops. And so um, for my workshop, I uh, proposed to do a paper quilt project with the students. And what that looked like was each student being um, uh, sort of given a uh, an eight by eight inch square sheet of construction color paper. And then um, the only, the only formal compositional requirement that I had of each student was for them to uh, to draw out a, a star-shaped element with um, with vertical, horizontal, and diagonal lines intersecting in the center of the page, um, and then from there building upon that um, element using paper shreds, um, and then filling in the space, uh, the negative space around that element with different collage materials. Um, such as um, images from comic books, from magazines, um, origami paper, other color paper. Um, and so the students had um, uh, the opportunity to sort of embellish and, and, and decorate their own um, square. And that square kind of became a patch for a greater uh, quilt made out of paper. And so on the left side, there's an example of one student's work and the blue and the scissors and whatnot. And then on the right is uh, these elements laid out in um, what, what was then the uh, quilt to be constructed. And so I conjoined all of their elements together to create uh, two large scale paper quilts. And this is the result of the two days um, of the workshop. And so on the left is day one, right is day two. And they were installed in the hallway, uh, one of the hallways of the, um, of the middle school. <coughs> so this is, uh, like I said, day one's students, and then this was the second day's. And um, I'll end on um, with an exhibition that I just um, mounted and, and called A Ground to Stand On. And this is an exhibition that is culminating the uh, work of the spring 2022 graduate painting and drawing workshop participants. And um, so this is not my work. This is the, the work of the, um, the painting MFA students in this class here at the University of Iowa. But I wanted to um, include this. A part of the way that I went about teaching the graduate workshop this semester was to have the students think about their work in multiple contexts, um, one through the vantage point of the artist lecture, two being the studio visit, three being the formal critique, and the fourth being um, the exhibition. And so, you know, in so many ways that the, the artist, that the exhibition becomes um, uh, the site of where the work has <clears throat> excuse me, become finalized, become um, um, sort of has become, you know, we're being presented with the, the work um, sort of 
without the uh, non-diegetic sound and space and material conditions um, informing that. And so um, um, I wanted to sort of build a class around the idea that all of those things outside of the context of the exhibition are important and, and, and informative. Um, but to be clear, this takes the, the formal sort of conventional, um, uh, up, you know, it takes the, the conventional approach to an exhibition. But these are some of the students work on the right is um, Catrice Kelly, a first year painting in the Fay, and left is Kayla Rump, a uh, second year uh, MFA candidate. And Jordan Ishmael on the left and um, Renisha uh, Robichaud on the right. Brooks Cashbo on the left, um, uh, Sophia, uh, I forget her last name, I'm sorry, Sophia. <laughs> but her sculpture is in the middle and then Jordan is again on the, on the right. Um, Sophia's painting on the right, Kayla in the middle, and then a um, constructed garment with embroidery elements by Nea Gord, um, Gordon, Gordon um, on the left. And this is the backside of that, that garment. And then on the right, you see um, a diptych by Lachlan Hinwood. And I kept it short and sweet this year. So that is, um, that is my presentation. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions that uh, you all may have. Thanks, Jonathan, that was fabulous. Thanks for walking us through what you've been up to in the last year. Um, Questions can be put in the Q&A &A box um, and we'll, I'll pose them to Jonathan for you. Um, I'll kick it off with a question that I had as I was looking through all of the work that you showed, especially when we got to your sketchbook, it became clear how much playfulness is a part of your process. Um, but looking at, especially the cut paper, it's not immediately obvious that that is so integral to your thinking and working through ideas. Um, I think it's a little bit more, it becomes a little bit more clear when you were showing the um, example of the splatters that happened um, when you were painting and laying the cut paper on top from Untitled 2021. Um, do you feel um, a tension between playfulness and kind of the accuracy and precision needed to do the cut paper? Um, how do you kind of think about that? the place of playfulness in your process? Yeah, that's a really great question. I would say that playfulness in the in the practice or in my process, I, I would say maybe can be synonymous with with maybe speed, like slowness and fastness. And so the there there is a a very felt difference in the experience of painting the constructed objects as it is constructing them. The construction process where I'm, I'm taking the paper shreds and I'm, um, I'm adhering them and, 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 and thinking about how lines are interlacing on to one another. That process is, um, it's meditative and it's, it's calming, but it also can be kind of overwhelming when I know um, I have like 40 more hours of this, <laughs> <laughs> to do <laughs> and um and the painting process is is a lot more fluid it's a lot less calculated it's it's a lot less um maybe th there's more room for um for error for surprise for for things to be discovered um in the making and so i think with this this painting sort of evidences for me like the chaos <laughs> that is kind of the process of painting these things and coming to some sort of like um, bridge between their um, their geometric compositionality and the um, and the element of the paint um, accentuating, highlighting, or um, articulating that. 
but I think that like the playfulness comes in the drips and it comes in the um, conditions of the of of seeing what happens when the paint breaks away from the um, the, the the structure and let's say rigidity of the pattern and um, and so I guess the playfulness comes in with the things that I allow myself to not be in control of and um, and that that often is very exciting and satisfying because um, because the because I don't want the work to be hermetic I do want there to be these points of entry um, or elements of surprise that push up against um, the its relationship to a type of non-objective abstraction. Do you find those um, instances where there are unexpected tears, um, like in kind of the first example that you showed where you had to mend in three places, is that kind of part of that kind of response and kind of surprise and chaos that comes into it? Um, it is, it is like, I, I, I remember I had a friend ship me a work from, um, ship me a work from New Haven, Connecticut to Memphis, Tennessee, when I was at Crosstown Arts in um, the residency in spring 2020. And I remember getting the piece, I mean, they had rolled it <laughs> and I had already primed it several times over. And so the it was it was stiff and um and so when I unpackaged the work there were um there was like a whole row of like um at least 10 or 12 places where the the strips had ripped and I had to that was actually how this mending process even came about I was like oh my god what am I gonna do and then I was like okay wait I can just um you know like make a little split for <laughs> <laughs> for these tears and then that that like that sort of also became a condition where the the uniformity of the surface was broken or where there was like this evidence of the history of the object and its construction um to what extent a viewer can look at that and say oh wow that that that's like this creative little splint thing that the artist did um, is unclear. However, um, I do think that there is evidence of a type of negotiating my relationship to these objects that are, um, that have a delicacy to them, that have a very sort of like, um, even though I'm trying to make them look sturdy and durable and some of these patinas look metal-like in nature, it's still made out of paper. Um, it's still a vulnerable material and object and things happen but that also kind of created an opportunity to think about playing with these threads like these sort of loose threads that that um like i said that intersect with the geometric pattern yeah there's something i mean it, it ties into quilting but it also kind of ties into like the body and the body's fragility um, it reminds me kind of of Frida Kahlo's um, paintings where there are the threads connecting hearts together or body parts, the kind of the ability to reassemble or create relationships or continuums in, in different materials. Absolutely. Um, I've got one more question for you. Um, unless anything new comes up in the Q&A. Um, can you talk a little bit about what it was like um, working in Amina's house? Um, did you find her um, kind of the eclectic spirit of her decorating or just kind of being in the space influencing any artistic choices you made or just sort of affecting kind of the vibe of the space or like your mindset as you were working and living in it? Um, that's a great question. I don't, I don't, it's hard to answer because I, I, I was talking about my experience at Amina's house and in, in this residency recently. And 
it's one of those experiences where the impact of it almost comes sort of subconsciously to you. <laughs> I feel like, um, you know, like when I was in Amina's home, um, which is located in the Shepherd neighborhood of Columbus, Ohio, it's you know a historically predominantly black neighborhood, working class, and and the neighborhood was um, was like a really amazing sort of location or site. Like I felt protected by the neighbors. I felt I felt looked after, um, which was really beautiful. And inside the house, there was there was this. It's hard to speak about it, but there was this power or energy, you know, like there was a felt sense of her spirit sort of, um, I think being present there. And, and, and so I think for me, there was, I felt pressure in the sense of her legacy is so impactful and powerful and the work that she left behind is absolutely extraordinary in both its, its, its materiality, like, she did a lot of buttoning work. She did a lot of embroidery. Um, she worked across several media and then um, sort of thinking, and then thinking about the trajectory of her artistic career and, and how, um, how it often kind of conflict, conflicted with my own ideas around what um, success as an artist looks like and, and what, um, what trajectory I thought I was on. And so I think that like there was, there was a lot of, um, I'd say it was much more mental and conceptual in nature, sort of thinking about like, what is it that I want out of an art, or art an artist's life, uh, out of a life as an artist? Um, because for Amina, it was, you know, art defined her daily lived existence. Like she worked 20 hours a day. <laughs> and, um, you know, and there's some aspects about her practice that, um, seem seem really intense to me, but um, so I'm not exactly sure. I do think that you know there were books about quilting and about um, uh, hieroglyphics and, and Egyptian history in her home, and and I think that there to me what felt really powerful was that my time there and the work that I made, like this work is inherently diasporic in nature, um, even though it does not rely on figurative or pictorial representation. It doesn't really even rely on, on figurative and pictorial abstraction. I mean, this, you know, I very much am, I, I accept and, and own the fact that I work in a, in a tradition that's defined more or less by a type of rejection of nature or a non-objective um, uh, non picture making. Um, however, I've always thought about my, um, these compositions in relationship to a type of expanded conceptual framework um, that takes into consideration the complexity of my experience as a black queer person, but to the complexity of the lived experience of blackness, queerness, and otherness in general. So um, it felt it felt beautiful to be in her house and to be and to feel affirmed in my work's contribution to. Um, to, an, to, to a Black American art historical um, canon. Well, thank you, Jonathan, for joining us tonight, for sharing your work and answering our questions in such a thoughtful and expansive way. Um, so I appreciate your time. Um, and thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thank you all. It was a pleasure. <laughs>